Thanks, Adrian. Um, now, this workshop today is the first in a series of three workshops that are going to be led by Dr. Sally Bamber from Chester University and Chris Henry, Head of Maths at Connors Key High School. And I'm incredibly grateful to both of them for their willingness to run these sessions. So on that note, I'm not going to delay things any further. I'll pass you over to Sally and Chris. Thank you both. Thanks very much, Sean. That's brilliant. It's lovely to see some familiar faces here. Hello, people, and some new faces as well. And I think we're going to be thinking about um, primary and secondary maths. So hopefully there'll be something for people in, in both of those phases. Chris, did you want to say hello? I just clicked off that. <laughs> it does it sometimes. Just to reiterate what other people say, um, yeah, I'm Chris Henry, head of maths at Connors Key, and, and we've tried in the past couple of years to do these sessions uh, together, but we're limited at the moment to Zoom, aren't we? So um, hopefully you get something out of it. And any questions, if you want to use the chat, Sally and I will respond or get in touch with us afterwards. Our email addresses are on the on that first page there. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chris. And we'll be sharing the slides as well. Um, Sean will be passing those on on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, so we just thought we'd um, start with just a really quick introduction of where this um, kind of project, if you like, has come from and what, what's been happening. So what, part of my job at the university is to work with schools as um, part of kind of raising attainment in GCSE maths to support access to higher education. So it's the university's support and commitment to trying to get more students into, into higher education. So I get to do projects with whole departments, which is brilliant. And so Chris and his colleagues welcomed me into the department a, a few years ago. I'd been in and out as a PGC tutor, but we were actually concentrating on these kind of whole, uh, whole department staff development at that particular time. So we've done some work on algebra, percentages, geometry, and Chris has got loads of resources that he has then adapted into the context of the, of, of the, the classrooms in Flintshire, and he's, he shares those willingly. So we were doing some great work just before the pandemic kicked off, and we're really pleased to be starting that again now. So one of the things that we've done is following this teacher research group model or this, um, this collaborative lesson research model where we'll have some professional learning. We'll go into the classroom together, which I think is a really important key feature of this. So we'll be side by side taking responsibility for the students' responses. Then we'll evaluate the students' responses and then think about where that goes next. So it's that lovely iterative cycle where we go into the classroom and step out. And it's never about the performance of the teacher. It's not about that at all. It's a shared responsibility for how the students respond to a lesson that we've designed. So a few, few features of this work is that there's going to be different views. There's going to be review, views where perhaps I'm translating research and teachers have got established practices and know their students well. So we sometimes have differences of approach. And the, the work that we do together is about trying to um, work in the best interest of the students and to respect the contribution that, that everybody brings. So across these three sessions, we'd really hope that you'd be able to go into the classroom, perhaps with a colleague in your own school, and perhaps be able to try some of these ideas out and come back and share how things have gone. And hopefully it'll be a stimulus for a, a little bit of work there. So uh, we have professional development sessions, which is basically what we're looking at today. And we're starting this sequence of three sessions today. And then we interrogate the students' responses and focus on the learning of the students, which I think is, is really, really important. Um, and so, yeah, just to reiterate anything that we're asking people to do and trying some of these ideas out in the classrooms, nothing at all to do with the performance of the teacher. It's sharing responsibility for designing a lesson and then interrogating the learner's work and the learner's responses within the lesson. Uh, so to start off with a maths problem, I would like you to have a go at convincing me that the sum of three consecutive numbers is always a multiple of three. So if I give you a minute to have a think about that, think about how you might convince me. And I don't think, uh, I think you might perhaps start with some particular examples. That's absolutely fine. It doesn't say prove, it says convince me. You might draw a diagram. This is me not shutting up. I'm not very good at that. Not giving any thinking time. I know. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> So 
Chris, can you see the chat? Yeah. Great. So if anybody wants to pop any comments in the chat or if you want to put your hand up to make a comment or if you just want to unmute and, and shout out a comment, I think there's few enough of us here to for people just to unmute and, and have a go. Anybody got any ideas or any comments that they could share there? Hi, I did a bar model, but you could do algebraically, I guess. Okay, lovely. Have you got a picture you could just hold up to the screen, Catherine, or have I put you on the, on the spot there? If you just come a little bit closer. Okay, brilliant. All right, lovely. Excellent. Um, what is your long rectangle representing there, Catherine? That's representing my number, my first number, my X or whatever. Okay, brilliant. And how would you convince me from that diagram that whatever that X or that first number is, is always going to lead me to a multiple of three? Because I put them in three lines at the end. Lovely. Excellent. So you've kind of drawn a picture of the animation. And if we were face to face, I imagine you'd actually tell the story as well. You were while you were doing that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Was, yeah. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. That's kicked us off beautifully. Um, is there a comment in the chat? I'm always a bit scared of looking at the chat while I'm sharing my screen in case it's, it disappears. It's fine. It's, Nick's put in the... Um the sort of algebra version of what Catherine's drawn. Okay, lovely, lovely, excellent, excellent. Um, fab, so they're, they're great ideas. And I think um, perhaps, you know, some of you might've been sat there just thinking, okay, I'll try this out. I'll choose a particular example. So I'll do five plus six plus seven or 10, 11, 12, whatever it is that you choose. And I think that's lovely as well, you know, to look at and interrogate the structure of a particular example, see what that, exposes and then that will perhaps take you into a general example because what we're talking about today is this idea of algebraic thinking and how we might have some early ideas about algebraic reasoning so to go from a particular example to a general example is a really profound principle in our second in our school maths classrooms and that would be something that i would absolutely encourage don't think that we have to go straight to the general case when we're presented with something which um, which people have recognized as, as potentially algebraic, you can start with something particular. So similar to the image that you saw a second ago from Catherine, if I was to use Dean's blocks, then I could start with 10 and I could have my 10, 11, 12 represented as my 10, 10 plus one and 10 plus two. And you can see similarities with Catherine's image and my image there straight away. The only difference being Catherine's bar was representing any number whereas I've chosen to start with 10 as a particular number. And then we could start to think about that and I'm not, and I could draw attention to the idea that we've got these three tens here. So we've got these lovely sets of three and then we've got the three sticking out at the end in yellow and the color draws attention to that quite nicely, even though um, Chris will be able to tell you that I'm often saying, let's not have different colors for these tens and ones because it's the size that tells us what they represent. Nonetheless, I can see the advantage of colors here right now. And then we can start to think about what we've got here. We've got 10 plus 11 plus 12. And then we could think about partitioning the 11 into 10 plus one. So the start number plus one and 12 into the start number plus two. And then I could group those in a way that possibly helps me see why I've got a multiple of three. And then we can see that we've got our three times 10 plus three. And then I can perhaps start to think about, well, therefore I've got a multiple of three because I've got three multiplied by 11. And I could, if I wanted to, annotate the diagram to show exactly where those 11 threes are. I could draw further circles or further um, um, annotations on the diagram and we could see exactly where they are or, or where the three tens are. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. What I would ask you to do now is pick a different start number and be kind to yourself, pick something less than 10 if you like, and just track within what you can see on the screen, track where the track which bits would change. So what would change if you choose five as a start point, six as a start point and so on, just have a think about what would be different on the screen with a different start point. So if people have started to replace this 10 with something else, then in the second line, I imagine that's appearing three times. So if you started with five, you'd have five in the second line, 
five plus one and five plus two. So by tracking another particular example, then perhaps you're starting to model what would happen to this variable start point, the start point where it doesn't really matter where I start. And then we could start to think about actually doing something similar to the diagram that Catherine showed us and get rid of those um, lines that make me think that I'm starting with 10 and then use this general bar to represent any start point, any number. And we can start to have conversations about, we're always gonna have three times the start number plus three. And we can do that verbally and use the diagram to help us. And we can use the, the idea of tracking the 10 throughout all of these, um, these expressions that you can see on the left-hand side so that we could converge on, and this would be the end result and possibly the result that you'd get in the secondary school classroom rather than the primary school classroom. We can start to think about, okay, well, I can't have a first line that's equivalent to 10, 11, and 12, because I don't know what my starting point is. But I can have a general second line because I do know that whatever I start with, the second number will be that number plus one, and the third number will be that number plus two. So I can represent the second line as a general number, but I can't represent the first line because I don't know what the start point is. So we don't have the convenience of being able to represent them as numbers. But nonetheless, the structures are exactly the same. Then when I start to cluster them, so I can put my ends together and my numbers together, my ones together, then we can see what we've got here. We've got the first three symbols, n plus n plus n, represented by my three green bars, and then the one and the two represented by the yellow. And how gorgeous it would it be if we actually animated that and moved that in exactly the same way as Catherine had, so that we can start to see that actually I can make a rectangle with three rows of n plus one. And um, what we will be doing um, when we stop sharing, we're starting to look at some of the manipulatives. So we'll, we'll do that. And I hope that you can see some Dean's blocks being waved in the air right now. And we'll do that with my amazing visualizer, which involves me just lowering the screen of my laptop so you can see what I've got in front of me. And we'll have a look at that actual physical activity that we've, that we've got going on there. So what we're trying to suggest here is that we can take some really interesting ideas from number and actually interrogate the structure with number so that later on students are able to actually appreciate what happens when we don't know what the start point is and we start to represent that variable number with a letter. But in the early stages, doing that just with the particular examples, the numbers, and with language, and with these lovely visual and physical representations, is an absolute winner. And we don't have to start with defining what N means. We can end with it. We can converge on it after all of these experiences have taken place. So some of the ideas that we're using within this, these three workshops, so these ideas of go, that go back to Bruner's representations of knowledge. Now, you'll probably recognize those three words more um, quickly than you'll, represent, or that you'll recognize the inactive, iconic, and symbolic. So we've inher inherited a lot in the United Kingdom the, the terms that are used in Singapore, concrete, pictorial, and abstract, but they mean exactly the same thing. The abstract is Bruner's symbolic ideas. The pictorial is iconic, you know, like we have icons that signify something, but they're not actually the thing itself, but it's an icon that helps us recognize the idea. And an active is the concrete, the, the physical activity. I much prefer this representation though from Haylock and Tangata, who've done a tremendous amount of work in supporting primary school teachers in, in their mathematical knowledge. And I really like the way they've presented that using this lovely triangular base the triangular base pyramid, nearly said prism then. Good job, it's not a geometry session. So what we've got here is each of those representations is connected to all three of the others. So it's not a particular order because some students might make sense of the symbols before they make sense of the language or the images before they make sense of the symbols and, sh and so on. But if we've got a classroom where we've got all three of those, then I think we're on our way to being able to support students really well with with using different ideas. So there's a few links there that people might want to use to have a look at these ideas in a little bit more detail. So I'll hand over to, to you, Chris. Thanks. Uh, this is sort of another one to do. We, we did this with Dean Blocks. This is one of the sessions Sally and I did, and it was an introduction to factorizing and expanding um, linear equations and eventually going into quadratics. Um, but it was just, so give out 
40, four tens, eight ones, and get them to make a rectangle with no gaps. Um, the instruction that the first time we did it was no gaps. It's been edited to no spaces for a reason that you'll see um, see shortly. Uh, and and one of the things with these manipulatives, they just leave them out. So it's one of those that they're always there. As Sally said, if you want, if they want to go back to them and lean on them, there's no specific order. Um, this class that I did this with turned out to be um, one of the, the best factorizing quadratics, sort of intermediate level class that I'd done um, because of because of the manipulatives that we used. So uh, we should end up with, if you do using four tens, eight ones, we should end up with, um, I'm going to be a little bit number 10 down in street and I'll keep asking Sally to click the next button. And <laughs> um, we should end up with this. Um, and we can obviously put the numbers on and have that conversation. Uh, this can also obviously lead into things, but you know, your grid method multiplication and your um, division and, and things like that. So it can be used and hopefully it's um, an image or a model that, that learners are used to. Um, and then obviously we can change the, the, the 12 into 10 plus two, and that will give us our uh, other form at the bottom of 48 equals four lots of 10 plus two. And, and again, it's the language that we're using. It's the four lots of, it's four rows, making sure that you know they understand that they're equal. So with the, with the last example for the multiples, it's because you've got equal rows, you can, you can split them up. Um, my favorite no, which is a, a term, this is the one that I got. So this was no gaps. And this was, you know, when you give out a task and you think you've thought about all the answers you're going to get, and then there's always that one kid that surprises you. And I just didn't expect this at all. I was like, it's got a massive gap in the middle. Um, but they convinced me it wasn't a gap, it was a space. So I had to edit my, uh, had to edit my description. But then we, it, 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 you know, it prompted a nice discussion about, uh, well, what have they made? They've done the perimeter rather than the area, which is what I was after. Um, so we got quite a nice little discussion, discussion going about that. Um, if we move it on to the the um, sort of algebra, so we've got ten plus two, and if you're going to use, you know, if you're doing different bases with certain classes or whatever, then. This can be maths bot, we've got the links for, can, will give you the, the blocks, the Dean's blocks with different bases. So instead of it being a 10, it can be a seven or or whatever. And then you've got your, your sort of algebraic form. Again, I've used X instead of N. So it just then gets that. Well, we, we know 48 was four lots of 10 and two. So this one is four lots of X and two. And get them to think about those different forms and what they've got. Um, something I haven't put on this slide actually is, so you could say that that was 40 plus eight on the left-hand side. So this is four X plus eight on the right-hand side and it leads eventually into that um, conversation around factorizing and um, expanding. Yeah, I think, and also before you went there, you did some really nice things with the students, um, whereby you looked at what the area might be if X was seven and X was five, yeah. uh, which we can show people with the math spot a little bit later, can't we? But they, they were, I think, really, really important questions to get them to interrogate the structure by saying, what would the area be when X is six? And and then yeah. questions like, oh, I've forgotten what value of X I used, but I remember that the area was 44. And that really got the students inside that four rows structure, I think, didn't it? Yeah, and it, you know, it, in one lesson we've done, so if you've been doing it traditionally, you've got factorizing, expanding, solving, uh, substitution, you've got all this range of, and they're not, they're just doing it because of, because of that structure, because, you know, we've got whiteboards out or we've got algebra tiles, so that some of them physically wrote a six on, if we said X was six, they physically wrote sixes on and drew it. Um, counted it up and added it up that way. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there was lots of work between between the, the expanding and stuff, but it's sort of just linking in the numerical thinking, the number into the into the algebra as well. Yeah, lovely. Uh, and then, the, so it moves on, we do a lot of work around that with the linear, and then it moves on to the, uh, to the next one, which is 168, make a rectangle, no gaps, no spaces. Um, we end up with uh, that one. 
<laughs> and then you've got so again you, it's the sort of same process isn't it you're keeping the language the same so we've got 12 and 14 there's again the link to the the um grid method multiplication there's a link to division you know, 168 divided by 12 or uh, 14 times 12 and and so on um so if you click through the next couple of points so you've got that again the same and then 10 plus 4 um and then that moves on quite nicely you know again what what have you got if you put a you don't know it's 10 so you don't know the length of the blue one or the green ones so you've got your x plus you've got your algebraic um expressions and you've got your quadratic for you know forming and uh factorizing quadratics so this worked quite nicely as well because it, it just they didn't it wasn't a big step into a quadratic which with a sort of intermediate lower intermediate group is a big jump for a lot they just don't see it whereas with this it was nice that they just sort of it was okay once you explain what the blue one was and the square then you know we had to have a little discussion about squaring numbers again and stuff but they were okay then they just they just sort of went yeah all right um, um and carried on we did have yeah. one we did have one lad didn't we who was determined to work out the length of the <laughs> of the x uh, and he wouldn't have it that he, he couldn't have it as whatever number yeah, I think I think it's great that the students do that because it's so important that we, they realise that actually we have fixed this at a length, but we have to use our imagination as a and use it as a variable length. And I think in the next session we're going to talk a little bit about work we can do with perimeters to help them understand this idea of a variable length a little bit more. But yeah, it's it's, it's asking a lot, isn't it? When you, you well look, this is seven points something or five points something or four points something. Can you expect me to believe that it can be anything? And that's uh, part of their kind of transition into thinking mathematically and thinking algebraically to try to, to do exactly that, try to imagine that. And uh, those difficulties that the students throw up, you know, like the, the big space in the middle, the way that you've um, used those and, and made teaching points out of those, I think is really, really important that the students aren't left thinking, oh, well, I, I'm not making sense of that. They're, they're allowed to not make sense of it and then it be part of the teaching experience. Yeah, and, and the um, there's obviously a lot of work between jumping in, but that's another reason math spot's so good because you can change the length of your Dean's block. So when you're saying, what if it was six, you, they can see. So the jump from the the ten to well, it could be anything, isn't isn't as big as as it as it could have been. So you know, you, one example you're telling them it's six, the next one you're telling them it's twenty three. There um, some some really struggle with that that idea. So you know, the, the digital technology we've got now um, has really helped helped with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, should we just pause for some questions about what we've said so far, see if there's anything in the chat. Um, I can see the chat now. We haven't got anything else to the chat. But would anyone want to put their, um, their microphones on and say anything? <laughs> oh, no, my lights are going off. Hang on one sec. <laughs> OK. Right, OK. Brilliant. Yes. But, you know, the, what, what we're trying to um, suggest here is that the structure of the algebra and the structure of the number um, are very, very similar. And of course, there's differences because um, algebra moves into like these, these, jet, these symbols for things we don't know, these generalized numbers. But the idea of having 10 rows of 10 in the blue on the left hand side, if that's really embedded, then the idea of having X rows of X is possibly within students' grasp, and it's a little bit more imaginable for more of the students, especially when you start spend time to unpick it and think, okay, what would this look like if X was seven? What would this look like if X was two? What would this look like if X was zero? And don't shy away from those, those tricky ones as well. Then the students are starting to understand what we mean, where the, air, the variable is representing um, a generalized number. Whereas usually when we're just working with numeric expressions, we know exactly what that number is. It's representing a very particular number. But when you see the structure on the left and you see the structure on the right, you can start to imagine students making those connections so that if they've done things with the Dean's blocks and with the lovely array on the left-hand side, and that's understood deeply, then they've got more chance of understanding the structure perhaps on the right-hand side. Ab, 
Okay, Chris, should we, should we move on to having a look at the principles of progression, which is over to you, isn't it? Yeah, so this is obviously something that's coming in with the new curriculum as well. Um, sorry, I'll just respond to the sort of next comment there. Um, yeah, great. You don't have to. I mean, like you say, if you've got, um, we we printed off a lot of algebra tiles. You know, you can you can print off um, if it's a bit cheaper. But I think hopefully with with the new curriculum that we're just about to talk about, they should be coming through with that knowledge of Dean's blocks from primary school a bit more now. Um, like I said, MathSpot is very good if you've got you know uh, a set of computers or a computer room you can use. Um, then it, it's it's all on there, but you know it does support, it does link in, but hopefully, like I say, the the dean's blocks are there from from primary school. If you had one set that you shared, it might be might be worth it. Yeah, I think there's some primary people in the um, in the call. I think whether well, there might be is anybody here from who's teaching in primary could share how dean's blocks are being used or which which year groups dean's blocks are being used. At the moment in their school, just stay quiet if I've put you on the spot and you'd rather not. Um, but yeah, like Chris says, you know, the, the use of Dean's Blocks, who where perhaps they used to be seen perhaps in year two, year three at the start, or they were just kind of taken out of the cupboard when students were in difficulty. There's much, much more um, insight into what they offer now all the way through. And so you, uh, we're seeing more and more classrooms where the, the Dean's Blocks are on the side to be to be used where, as appropriate, not just seen as a sign of a sign of weakness and so on. So I think that's just that's really important. Um, and we, you know, as Chris will be able to tell you in the next couple of weeks, the students who were using the algebra tiles in the classes, they didn't need them for long, but they were always there to fall back on. So perhaps similarly with the dean's blocks, that you don't need them every lesson, but if you've got them in the room and it's a natural part of just going to get them and use them, then fantastic. And I've been working with um, one of the high schools in, in Chester this week, and um, they're using printouts like we do with the kind of cardboard version of the algebra tiles that we use. They're using printouts of the dean's blocks, and it doesn't seem to matter that they've not got the 3D plastic versions or um, that I was waving in front of the camera before, that doesn't seem to matter. What matters is that it's a really important image that they can move around. And the, the students that kind of made the um, the six, tens, eight ones and the, um, the the image that you see on the left-hand side, when they were doing it with algebra tiles on the right-hand side, I think it really is important that their initial um, experiences are allowing them to move it around physically because there's a lot of kind of intuitive experiences that go on there where they start to reject solutions that don't let the eight ones fit in properly. And so just having them there, I think is really, really important, but they don't need to be expensive um, plastic ones unless you've got the money, of course. Fab, good question. Thank you. Chris, back to you for principles of progression. Sorry, just to, uh, with the Dean's Block, we, we've got a box from somewhere. I don't remember buying them, but they're here anyway. And one of my low ability year 10 classes that was doing subtraction and we used them and I thought they wouldn't like them, but they really did. So it really helped them see. And even now some of them will ask me for them. So like I say, if you've got a set, it's usually worth um, having them in the cupboard just in case. Uh, but I've, I think I've used them more in the last 12 months than I've, um, than I've ever used Dean Blocks in all the years I've been teaching. So yeah. Um, so principles of progression are sort of come in with the new curriculum. Um, this was something that I did at a meeting run by Guare when the, the new curriculum was being launched. Um, and I've started doing it in my departmental meetings uh, to try and get that that flow that you can see on the sort of diagram into, into our planning. Um, so these are the... The idea is that should be embedded in the what matters statements and obviously therefore within our teaching. So the next slide just shows the definitions of each one. Um, Sorry, it's not moving forward. It's being awkward. There we go. <laughs> so there's the, the sort of definitions of each one just to, so you've got an idea um, of what they mean. They're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, I think what you would expect. Um try and include them like you say in our in our planning but you're not going to do them all all the time um but there should be that sort of um loop 
loop on it. So one of the the ones that we're sort of looking at now is about the the logical reasoning in the in the in the box there. That they should apply logical reasoning about relationships, be able to justify and prove them. The box at the bottom um, demonstrate conceptual understanding by explaining and expressing concepts, finding examples. Um, as Sally just said, with the not and non-example so we're getting there not being able to put the eight ones in, in in the rectangle so that's why it doesn't work and things like that so all of what we've sort of talked about fits in quite nicely with these so on the on the next couple of slides i've just shared some of the ones we've done so we've decided to go for sort of addition and subtraction this is a very generic addition and subtraction one i know um, i've spoken to other people who have gone a bit more um specific with these uh but it's you know it's whatever whatever you decide and works for you, isn't it? So we we sort of went with distance subtraction. So I sort of paired up, we pair up in our meetings and then come back and, and, and write a write a whole one. Um just to sort of see, you know, the, the, the communicate with symbols and, and we sort of took that as language as well. Uh the conceptual understanding, the, the convince me stuff. Um and it just just allowed us to to think about things that Sally's done with us um in a bit more detail and how you know we don't just fall back into our uh old ways of of just showing the methods and 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 expecting kids to be able to deal with different the concepts in different situations so you know even things like addition and subtraction put the question but with missing numbers give them the answer and put missing di digits in just they can you do column addition do they really understand how it works or are they just following regurgitating a process that that they've been shown um so that's for the multiplication uh the sorry addition subtraction that this one's algebraic thinking um and this is this is sort of these are progress sorry i keep saying progress step and i mean progression step three uh things this this is all sort of the bits from them is what we've been focusing on as a as an introduction. Um, I'm really using the manipulatives, especially with year seven, because they do use them a lot in primary school. Um, and we just sort of ignore, well, used to just sort of ignore them a little bit when, when they came to us. So they're good at using them, they know what they're doing, so let's keep it going. Um, mm -hmm. Bringing in all different symbols, that's just a blank one. That's okay. our template. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it's these are just like I say, quite generic mm -hmm. things we've done. Um, but we will, and I know, like I say, other people have come in and, and have gone a bit more specific with them. But it has, it's really benefited our planning. You know, especially with all the ideas and concepts of the new curriculum coming in. Mm -hmm. um, it does. It does. We revisit these as well quite often. So it allows us to, to. Did we do that? You know, did we use the right manipulatives? How did it go? Um, would you do it again? Kind of thing. Um, one thing I would say with the manipulatives is don't worry if it doesn't go great the first few times. Um, learners have struggled, well, they've not been in, in classrooms and stuff for a while, so making sure that they do, in, in some cases, the, the work Sally and I did, we, we forced them, they had to use them, the tiles because they were reluctant to, but we I wouldn't accept their answer until they showed me using the tiles. So, you know, we, we forced it on them a little bit in some cases as well. Mm. Um, but long term, it, it did benefit them. Yeah, brilliant. And I, well, I love what you're saying there about this. This is like a working document. You're going to look back yeah. on it. You're going to move forward with it. It's not a finished piece of work because you don't know how the students are going to respond to this, do you? And it's going to be really nice to see it as you go through that iterative process, I think completely and, and some of the things we've done to um help them to introduce the um these representations these you know algebra tiles and what uh, um whatever it's not just algebra tiles is it we've done quite a few things and um, that we have to kind of carefully introduce it to the students but the reasoning questions that you've applied in the classroom have really helped them to use them so it's been used the algebra tiles to convince me that um 4x plus 8 factorizes into four brackets x plus two and so it's not about the answer they're given the answer but they've got to tell you the story and i think that's been 
a really nice development of those kind of convince me and show me and um, how do you know that? And I think that sometimes has helped them see the purpose of them because they have been developing their reasoning in, the, in that way. Yeah, that can, can, the convince me question um, was something that, that you know you, you first showed me really, um, but it has really helped with the understanding because they, they can be quite um, generic with something to say, like do an area of a rectangle, you just multiply, multiply what, be a bit more specific, be why do you do that? And, and that, so that they, those sorts of questions do really help. And like you say, give them the answer. Tell me why the, the answer is 27 or, you know, whatever it is and, and things like that. So yeah, it has really helped. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, and one of the things we've done, and I'll be able, when I stop sharing my screen in a second, I'll be able to show you this in a, a little bit more detail. We've done matching tasks to help students match the the um, symbolic and the visual representations. So, you know, that some seeing an image like this or being able to actually make them themselves. These are red skittles, by the way, because I think it's important to be able to eat maths. And these are images where the answer is not important. They're all 30 and it doesn't matter that they're all 30. What matters is that we're looking at the structure and students are able to tell us what they can see and what they notice and then start to then hopefully connect them to the symbolic representation so they can see the three rows of 10 in the first one but then also if they turn their heads around they can see the 10 rows of three or they can see the 10 columns of three as well and then similarly with the the two times 15 and obviously then we can have one row of 30 and then we'd have all of the factors of 30 represented on the screen so these ideas of using this structure like the array early on and then building on it and always having it as, as something to come back to it is a what some people call like a conical structure. It's a really fundamental, important structure in mathematics whenever we're meeting the product of two things. And it doesn't matter what those two things are, but the products of two things can often and usually be represented using this, this lovely array. So it's a very powerful multiplicative reasoning structure that can go all the way through from early primary all the way to degree level, you know, certainly up to A level. And um, similarly with this one, the color has been used here very deliberately. You know, it's similar to the first image there, but actually the color has been put there very deliberately. And we talked to the school that we use this resource with. I talked with them about, you know, should we leave a gap in the middle or not? And, you know, we decided to leave the gap. I'm not sure if that was the right idea. Nobody does, but that's what we chose to do. And then we were able to think about how that might connect with the symbols on the matching task. So if I just kind of wave those in front of the camera, hopefully you can see them. Students were given these cards to match and then they had some odd one out because then they had to realize, oh, actually there's two expressions that tell the story of this one. And therefore there's two expressions matching to this one picture. Whereas previously we only had one expression matching and then talk, start talking about what other things they might be able to come up with. So what we don't see there is the nine plus 21, because if we put nine plus 21, we've taken away the structure and the relevance of the three. So the nine plus 21 is the natural consequence of being able to use, understand the structure. It's obvious if you understand the structure. So that's kind of something that would just follow naturally from what we can see in these, these expressions here. And then once again, you can start to think about, okay, what would this look like if I change this image instead of having three rows, if I hid one and we've only got two rows? Or what would this look like if I doubled the number of rows and we've now got six rows? What would change in these expressions? So it's a low stress entry because the matching tasks are there, but there are all sorts of questions that can be asked for students to be able to then think about what would change and what would be different. And even though there's no N's or X's on the screen, that's a really fundamental part of algebraic thinking to start to think about how numbers behave when we vary them. And similarly with the bottom ones here, and then we could start to ask students rather than go like extending the rows, we could ask a different question whereby we could ask for a picture, draw me a Skittles diagram for the expression that you can see on the screen and convince me that those two expressions are indeed equivalent. So you can spend a lot of time just using one structure and get a lot of mathematics from a deep understanding of just that, just that particular structure. So um, just, be, just before we do this, I don't know if we're gonna have time for that, actually, we might just do that next time. Yeah, I'll, actually, sorry, yeah, just to be really contrary, I'll stop sharing my screen as because we want plenty of time for questions, but um, 
a, a class I was in in a school in Chester this week and have been working with for a, a little while since we were allowed back into classrooms again. Um, assessments show that the pupils have little sense of variable in most algebra contexts and a reluctance to answer algebra questions. So we've got some exphobic people in this particular group. They see the N's, the X's, the Y's, the T's, and they shut down. And they've convince themselves that they don't do algebra and they're not capable of using algebra so we're trying to change their beliefs about themselves and even though we can't recover the whole content of GCSE with them um, in terms of algebra we can start to perhaps just tackle that really important problem that they fear symbols and they have no meaning to them so what we've done is use this kind of sweets in the cup context where the right hand side, you can see that there's three cups that have got counters in rather than sweets. They did have sweets at one point, but they all got eaten. So we've got three cups of counters in, but five counters have been taken out of one of the cups. And what they do know is on the other table, there are 13 counters because the number of sweets in the cups at the moment is equivalent to 13. So then the students are able to make sense of that numerically. We're not pushing them and rushing them to some sort of algebra. How many sweets in a cup? That's the question. Make sense of it any way you like. And then you can see this lovely conversation with Kai and Kai's attendance in year 11 is 33% so far. So there's huge gaps in Kai's knowledge. But you can see from this conversation that he was able to make sense of how many sweets were in the cup. So he's used algebra reasoning without communicating any algebra. So if we can help Kai to translate that into some sort of context that he can work with, where one of the students was writing down a picture, don't like X's, can't do it, it's got an X in. So three, the number of sweets in three cups is equal to 18, the number of sweets in one cup is equal to six. And then another previous algebra refuser was able to tell the story using the X's and actually relate it exactly back to what they could see on the screen and the teacher was able to model it. But the reason for sharing these now, because we're gonna go into this in much more detail in the next few lessons is that in the next few sessions, is that the students saw this as a number puzzle and not as an algebra puzzle. And that gave them a kind of low stress entry into what ends in something that looks like some quite fluent algebra for the uh, students in the English foundation tier. So perhaps on the borderline of that intermediate foundation tier in Wales. And then we've got the, some of the students' work, and you can see they're using this lovely hybrid of this pictorial and um, symbolic representation, which was really lovely progress, because for a lot of these students, their previous responses to algebra questions were um, resistance and question marks and can't do it and don't do it. And so this is a nice little uh, response from this group. No idea what the student's doing with that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I really don't know how they're working this out. But as of, we've not been back into the classroom with them because this was only the day before yesterday, we can find out. We can ask them what's going on there. But it's fascinating and they're getting the answers right. Really, really fascinating. And then some students you can really see here, you know, they're, they're telling the story, uh, particularly this one O at the bottom here, they're telling the story that kind of quasi numeric um, algebraic way going on there. There's neo algebra going on there, which I think is absolutely lovely. So just thought I'd share that with you. And we are gonna go into that in much more detail because it's, it's perhaps helping to reinforce this idea that we, um, I don't want to do a new share, I want to stop sharing. Why don't you let me share, stop sharing. I am still sharing, aren't I? There we go, now I've stopped sharing, fantastic. So just re, you know, reinforcing this idea that we can have a, these relationships between number perhaps can demystify. And some of the kind of procedural lessons that people have talked about that they've been trying to move away from have been perhaps starting with the definitions. So they, they think they're scaffolding well because they're starting with simple expressions like n plus two equals 11. But actually it's not the fact that they don't know that nine plus two equals 11 that's in the way. It's the concept of what the n is representing that's in the way. So that's been something you know quite powerful. Let me just introduce you to my really top quality visualizer going on here, because I do think even though we've represented everything here on um, images and symbols, I think it's so important that we allow the concrete to be in the room as well. And it doesn't have to be there for a long time, but I think it really does have to be there because the power of what Catherine had done with her lovely animation on her picture, I imagine that if she's with her students, she'd be doing that physically and thinking, well, hang on, what about if we pop that over here? And then we can start to think about as well, well, actually, 
what could you tell me if we didn't know where these started? And we cover this up and we think we don't know how long these are. We don't know if we started with 10 or 30 or 56. What we do know is that each of these bars is exactly the same, but we don't know where it started. Would you still be able to tell me that the sum of those three numbers would be a multiple of three? And the significant point is this bit here. Or if I brought in another three at that point there and starting to, I think I've just dropped the counter that I have ready, but there we go. If we had another three here, does it matter if it's gone to 11 or 21? Does it matter? And they have these experience of generalizing things because they're starting with particular examples and then imagining what would be different if I put another column of three here. Well, what would be different if I put another column of three in and another column of three? And they're starting to think about what would change and what the consequence of having a different start number would be. And I, and I just think that's really, really important. The matching task that we've used, even though some of the resources that we'll share with you have lots of different things to match up on them, we just choose very carefully and have a match, matching task, perhaps where we want the students just to match two sets of three or three sets of three. And we don't overwhelm them with too many at once, because as you saw in the illustration a second ago, the important thing is asking students questions about them and interrogating those pictures. So it's not, we're not as, as excited about the fact that they've matched them correctly, because there's usually enough clues within the image to be able to cheat and match them correctly. Once they've matched them, they've got some data in front of them, and then you can start to ask more challenging questions once they've actually matched, the, ma matched them in the first place. So the matching is just step one. It's the stimulus, it's the image that then for the for the wider question that comes a little bit later. Right, Fab, we have got some time left for, for questions um, or any comments at all or any observations. We welcome anything at all. Right, my, my name's Brent. My, my camera keeps going off and on, so I apologise. I don't know what's, what's going on. No, I, I, I've seen, I think I've seen you do this before and I, and I think uh, it'd be great to try in our school, so... Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bryn. That's great to hear. And um, perhaps, you know, some of, the, some of the simple problems that will give you a starting point might be just to do, you know, have a go of this or have a go of the 48 or the 168 problem. And just, you know, it, if you think about like the, what, what Chris is doing in school, that like is transforming how they're learning algebra across the school. He's quite far ahead in that in that journey, and that can sometimes be quite daunting. But it started with the one for one six eight problem or the forty eight problem. That that was like the starting point there. Thank, thanks, Bryn. I think one of the the key things that you sort of mentioned at the start with the the um, the first diagram was going in and, and supporting each other with the teaching. So the first time that 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 I did it, Sally, you were in, and um, Tracy from Flint High was in as well. And I think she bought a TA one time, didn't she, with the, the maths TA? So there was a class of about 23 with five, <laughs> five of us in the room. Um, so it's really useful that then to sit down, even if it's just 10 minutes after the lesson. And, and like Sally said, debrief about what did the kids do? There's, you know, there's no judgment on, on the member of staff at the front, which I know um, it doesn't bother me particularly anymore. Um, but I know some some sort of younger in terms of years teaching members of staff can can be a bit daunted having you know curriculum leaders or whoever in the room. Um, but it's it's to have a conversation about what did the kids in the room do. Um, you know, so you, you I can't see what all twenty four kids are doing in that class. But the fact there was someone else there to have those conversations and looking from behind sometimes it's really useful to look from behind while they're doing the work isn't it to, mm. to to see what they're doing and what their thought processes are and and pick up on the, on the different things um so i think if you can do that and i know time and cover and everything is is a massive restriction on that but if you if you can do that i i think that was possibly one of the things when we started this that i found most beneficial um we tend to kind of do it afterwards now you know, we, we can't get into each other's lessons as much as we would like, but we, we do still have those conversations after. Um, we've just got to try and pick up ourselves on, on what's going on. Thanks, Chris. 
I think it's very easy for me to say, like, it's not about the teacher's performance, but nonetheless, the teacher's under the spotlight, aren't they? The teacher's being watched, and there's always going to be that fear that the teacher's being judged. But I think if you've designed a lesson collaboratively, and you share responsibility for that lesson, when something perhaps doesn't go quite according to plan, or we don't get the response from the students that we were hoping, um, it, it's our lesson, it's not, it's not the teacher's lesson, and so that does absolve some of the responsibility but also like teachers want to reflect on what students respond and how they ask a question so they want to interrogate oh actually I should have asked that first but usually when you're looking at the students responses as data they they work that out they don't need anyone to tell them oh actually should we have asked this question first they don't need that because they've they're looking at the students responses and realizing themselves and that, that is a, a kind of cultural shift from what we've had a lot in the United Kingdom with this, with this idea that the lesson is a performance and you're going to be judged on that performance. And we'll, we'll extrapolate from this one particular performance all sorts of conclusions about other lessons. And to try and um, jar that and, and move away from that is it, quite difficult. But nonetheless, if we do, huge, enormous strides can be made in the development in the classroom. Anybody else got any, any questions or any comments? Um, anybody who's, who's kind of used some of these ideas already? And, you know, I, I know that the, I know from a lot of the work, you know, that Sean's talked about that's going on in Guare and things she's, that her and Chris are seeing in schools. There's loads of good stuff going on in, in schools already. You know, anybody be able to share? what they've done and how the students have responded and how their teachers have responded. Sorry, did you say there, there are a couple of, um, like, you know, like the question that Chris and you showed, have you got more, of, are there some of those to share? So, that, do you know what I mean? Or? Yeah, we've got loads of resources. Uh, you know, Chris has been really generous with it. The, what happens initially is I, I design some lessons based so I translate the research and design the lessons and then we work together to think about whether that's appropriate for that particular class or not, because Chris brings the expertise or whoever I'm working with brings the expertise in the class. So we've got loads of resources and there's, um, there's a, a, a course that we did online two years, ago, two years ago now that you can have the links to that, you can have all the resources from that, but they've also been deconstructed into individual lessons as well. Um, Chris and Sean, have we thought about how we're going to share those um, in any way? No, we haven't Not thought yet. how, but we, <laughs> we will we'll definitely have. look at, yeah. into, yeah, because that would okay. be great, wouldn't it? And I'm very grateful for both of you for willing to share any resources that you have. Um, I think that would that would just help everyone, wouldn't it, to just kickstart in a way and trial a couple of things out. Yeah. Oh, I can yeah. see... Thanks, I can Catherine. see a comment from Catherine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, can I just ask, what, what, what was their, um, it was the low retaining year nine, did you say? Uh, uh, what, what was their response initially when you're there with um, with cups and sweets, you know, rather than symbols and whiteboards? You mean before they, uh, you mean after they've said, can we eat the sweets? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> it was, it was, they started off being a bit grumpy about it and a bit mm. sort of slow about it. And then, um, then they went through a phase of going right cups and this and that and you know, uh, but then they went very sort of quite quickly actually to just being able to form the expressions and they didn't weren't really even thinking about sweets and cups anymore. Brilliant! Um, I'm Brilliant. surprised because I thought they would really struggle with it. No, that's great, and that's the resistance that I've seen. You know, my my job in terms of the raising attainment is a commitment to working with people in in key stage four and so we go in with these ideas a lot of the time particularly to middle to lower attaining year 10s year 11s and of course they're like this isn't maths and they resist it but it's not until it starts to provide a solution to a problem and it starts to make sense of the maths that they don't resist it anymore and the, some of the first lessons we did on quadratics at Connors Key were with um, uh, Kelly and Sophie one one side of the corridor one the other and I was kind of dashing well not dashing I don't dash I was walking quickly between the two lessons because things were happening in the lesson that the teacher wanted some advice on on live and there were some students there who were just I'm, I'm not using those tiles so remember that the teachers were like okay well draw draw the image draw the image on your whiteboard okay I'll, I'll, I'll draw my image and it was really lovely to see them perhaps in lesson two kind of just very uh 
quietly getting the tiles out themselves because they wanted to sort they wanted to solve a quadratic and the person on the table next to them was doing it successfully with the tiles and you, you see that lovely shift but of course they're going to resist initially because um if that's not something they've come to expect of their lessons then that's disturbing and you know it sounds like you you manage that really well Catherine oh <laughs> um yeah. it was the first time I'd done anything apart from pretty much chalk and talk with that class mm. so yeah they, they were just grumpy okay. but then they got over it so yeah it's fine yeah yeah, and, and some of the schools are going to, you know, they don't feel comfortable with their students using the manipulatives, in which case they use them from dem for demonstration under the visualizer. And when they're watching the teacher do it, they're using similar sort of, you know, brain power as if they're doing it themselves. And similarly, when, you know, when you're using MathBot, then you, the students seeing you move it around the screen is similar to them actually moving it themselves. So there's all sorts of things people can do if they don't really want to quite take the risk of the students using the sweets and cups themselves and the lesson you saw the pictures of a second ago that was the teacher demonstrating rather than the students doing it themselves and then later on they felt comfortable setting up the problem themselves with the cups but not initially it was something that came a little bit later on we've got time for one more question or one more comment brilliant okay questions no Anything to add, Chris? Hang on, I think you're muted. Your clicks not, aren't clicking. I'm on my laptop, so I have to press everything twice. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Just to sort of re reiterate what Catherine said with, with the reluctance, to be honest. Um, the older ones seem a bit more reluctant than, than the younger ones were okay. But yeah. in my experience, they have moved away from them very quickly. Um, on the whole, you know, when we do that retrieval stuff with the negative numbers with tiles and stuff and you throw them back out after a couple of months and, and, and then they're like, oh, yeah, okay. And it's just having them there sometimes as a, as a reminder as well. But, um, yeah, I, I I was one of those teachers that wouldn't give them scissors. I'd make sure everything was cut myself <laughs> first and anything else on the desk that could be a distraction was, was I sort of shied away from. But now I'm... Uh, I'm a convert, definitely a convert to just, yeah. but you do have to persevere and it can be extreme. I would say it can be extremely frustrating at first. Um, yeah. But yeah, and it just in response to, to, to Bryn as well with the thing, the, a lot of the, the factorizing and, and um, expanding lessons that we did moving on from the 48, um, we've got those sort of into about four or five lessons worth of stuff with those, haven't we? So yeah, we're mm -hmm. happy to share whatever, anyone can have anything I've got. Yeah. We'll just figure out where to put them on. Yeah, we, we will work that out. But also like the investment in Dean's blocks, I think it was Bryn that asked about that, wasn't it? You know, I mean, you don't need them for long, but if you haven't got them, it's a real toil. You know, so perhaps kind of like a, you know, one fifty quid box rather than a kind of like, you know, 500 pounds for a class set for every teacher, I think would be something that would be really valuable or to use a template print out a template and have some in envelopes like you know there's loads of envelopes um you know in, in your cupboard isn't the Chris there's all sorts of different cardboard versions of things and and it's it's a powerful image without it actually having to be a manufactured expensive plastic um piece of work thanks so much everyone and uh, thanks everybody for their their contributions and their and their questions as well and um we're looking forward to expanding some of this into some of the structure of algebraic expressions next time a little bit more formally perhaps yeah thank you to chris and sally for running the session this afternoon i think it's been brilliant um, and hopefully you've all found it useful um just to remind you the next session is on it's thursday january the 13th at four o'clock so hopefully we'll we'll see you there and what we'll do we'll we'll stop the recording and I'll, we'll sort out the link and I'll share that uh, with you because it might be useful for you to look, look back um, and we'll get in touch with, we'll think about how we're sharing the resources and we'll get in touch with that. So thank you for all for listening and attending the session. Um, and if it's not too early to say Merry Christmas team. So <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah.